And the final analysis, health isn't really about how you feel or how you look or even how great people say you look. It's really about what you do on a day-to-day -day or at least on a, a regular basis. And this, in front of you, we have what I would call the profile of a healthy person. It's what the person does. And of course, way up there is about having a focused, happy, and productive mind. Number two, of course, is what most of us know about. We need to have a good, a good diet. And of course, that eventually leads to nutritional supplementation, because we now know that your diet is not enough to provide the needs of your body. Now, number three there, a proactive approach to health, healthy living is really, I think, that is where people uh, fail the most because people just think that, well, health is all about me eating well and exercising, and they leave it at that. But I'm going to say this, that in this day and age, maybe 50 years ago, you, you, could, uh, you could get away without doing number three. But in this day and age, you really, really have to have a proactive approach. And what does that mean? It really means you have to keep on learning. It means you must keep, you have to remain open uh, all the time to information, new information that is coming out there. Because really, in this world we're living in, the threats, the toxins that are out there are just increasing in number. And our bodies are just not equipped to handle them. So we have to be open to seeing and looking at technologies that will help to protect us and our families from that. And really, I, I, when I'm, I'm, I'm talking about this, I, I think about my dear, very, very dear friend called Linda, Linda Swain. They just stepped a picture up there. And uh, I'm going to tell you, tell you her story in a minute. But really, she's someone who has had, I mean, she's practiced all the other things that we showed a, f a few seconds ago. But she has had headaches uh, for over 40 years, I think. Again, Linda's, Linda's on the call. She's, I'm going to let, let you have, let her, let you listen to her. But uh, it was just in a little, a couple of months ago after she had heard about what Rick had talked about. And, and so she decided to give it a try. And well, Linda, are you on the line? I am, Dr. David. <laughs> hey. <laughs> That sounds strange, doesn't that, <laughs> Linda? <laughs> All right, well, Linda, thanks for joining us on the call. Uh, would you like to just go ahead and say, just tell us your story as briefly as possible? Sure, I'd love to. Um, yeah, I've had headaches most of my uh, adult life, and um, but the worst came about uh, late November when I slipped on the ice and, and just seemed to cram my back and neck and head all together. And um, so I went to many chiropractor appointments, and, and I was taking Advil and Vanquish and trying all sorts of things, and nothing would um, even ease that headache. And then uh, David introduced me to uh, Wyora, the NCD drops. And I started on them on a Sunday night. I took 10 drops, and before the night was over, the head was, headache was gone. And I've been taking, so I took uh, 10 for maybe 10 days and then drop way down. And I've been on it now, I'd say close to two months, and uh, maybe had the start of one or two headaches. I can take a few extra drops and it's gone. So this is great to me. I am just so thrilled to have found this product. And um, I appreciate the opportunity to share my experience. And I hope others uh, can get on it and have a great uh, help with their health issues also. Well, great. Uh, I'm, I'm just so glad you, you've gotten this, so you, you can be less grouchy in the future. Oh, thank you. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. okay. I'll, I'll just get in. Thanks a lot, Linda. Talk to you later. Okay. Right. Uh, now, folks, uh, that, to you, a, a headache might not be a big deal, but obviously to some people it is. And really, this is not about just um, um, promoting a, an exclusive product. Um, it worked for her. Um, it may not work for everybody in the same way. And so, folks, you just have to remember, you have to keep on trying. Before Linda took these products, she had been using all kinds of products. I can tell you that now because I've introduced her to so many other products that are, have been out there. And she tried different kinds, and none of them really did, did the job. So uh, you just to remind you that you have to keep on searching, and you have to keep on looking. And um, bottom line, I don't think you can go wrong with a product that helps, to, helps you to um, rid your body of, of uh, toxins. So without much further ado, without much further ado, we're going to go ahead and share with you. I'll just, uh, just go ahead and uh, 
introduce, read, read, read Rick's, Rick's bio, and then we're going to have a few questions. Okay. I would love to introduce Rick, and I'm making her, him the presenter at the same time. So, okay, Rick Deitch is the Chief, Chief Executive Officer of Nutra Pharma Corporation, a biochemical biopharmaceutical company specializing in the acquisition, licensing, and commercialization of pharmaceutical products and technologies for the management of neurological disorders, cancer, autoimmune, and infectious diseases. Mr. Deitch also serves as the president of NDA Consulting Incorporated, a biotechnology research group that has provided consulting services to the pharmaceutical industry. He holds both a BS in chemistry and an MS in biochemistry from Florida Atlantic University and has conducted research in collaboration with Duke University's Medical School um, Comprehensive Canter Cancer Center and the Cleveland Clinic of Cardiology de uh, Department. Boy, these bios end up having so many tongue-twisting words. <laughs> Uh, he's the co-author of two books, and he'll probably tell us about one of them tonight. The names of his two books are You Are Age-Wise, which is a guide to healthy aging. Maybe we'll have to have him back on to talk to us about aging. And right. Invisible Killers, which uh, relates much more to what he's going to talk to us about tonight, a guide to environmental toxicity. So we are very honored to have him back with us again tonight. Rick, are you there? I'm right here, Sharon. Thanks. Okay, great. Yes, Rick, thank you so much for joining us on the call. And just, uh, I know you have quite a few things to share, but um, last time you were on, the main focus was on the production and the manu manufacture of zeolites. And, of course, you explained what that is. I'm sure you're going to say a few more things about it again tonight. But the main focus was on heavy metals. And, um, and I, would ha I would venture to say that in Linda's case, it probably wasn't heavy metals because she has been, I mean, she told me, she didn't mention it on the call, but for since the birth of her first child, well, her first child just turned 47 two days ago, she has been having headaches. So 47 years she's been having headaches on and off. So uh, I know on the bottle of, 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 some of the, on the bottle, the label says helps to clear and balance pH, helps to rid toxins, and of course the heavy metals things, and helps with the immune system. So basically, I'm hoping that during this webinar and during this presentation, you'll be able to um, explain those other actions that this uh, liquid zeolite has and just basically go into a little more detail. So it's all yours. And thank you. I would be happy to. And then in her specific case, I would first say that if you don't know, if you don't know this, the number one uh, complaint of people in the United States is headaches. The number one reason people see their doctor or go to the emergency room is headaches. And the number mm -hmm. one cause of headaches is either electrolytic imbalance or dehydration, usually a combination mm -hmm. of the two. Uh, I can't tell you how many people that complain to me of headaches or muscle cramping, uh, and they're simply not drinking enough water, and they have an electrolyte imbalance. Uh, in many cases, I usually am uh, hesitant to suggest this, but if they just drink some electrolyte drink, like a Powerade or a Gatorade, uh, they find mm -hmm. that they don't get headaches. And uh, mm -hmm. when, when it comes to zeolite, I, I'm going to explain how that works, but in essence, it, it stops the competition that normal electrolytes might have for heavy metals and other toxins. Additionally, some people have headaches, as you said, with the birth of our first child. It could be hormone-mediated. As hormones change as we get older and, and things change in our lives, uh, you could wind up uh, you know, changing basic chemistry because of your hormone imbalance. And uh, hormones are regulated by liver function, and if you have a healthier liver, you're better able to control those hormone levels. And so uh, as a downstream implication to a cleaner, healthier body, your body's taking care of things like, you know, liver, liver function. And so that's what I'm going to talk about tonight. As you said, my, uh, my most recent book, which came out uh, about a year and a half ago, is called Invisible Killers. And I invite everyone to visit the website, invisiblekillers.com. And the concept here is about the toxins in the environment. Where do they come from? How do they affect us? How do they get into our bodies, through our food, through the water, through the air? Uh, once they're in our bodies, how do they increase our risk for disease and dysfunction? What do they actually do inside our bodies? And then the most important thing, and the reason that we've uh, garnered so much attention, is we talk about detoxification. How do you avoid these things? How do you mitigate the risk of exposure? And how do you detoxify? How do you actively get these things out of your body? Uh, so that being the case, let's talk, about, um, let's talk about the first concept of detoxification. First, let's try to understand what happens to toxins when we're, uh, when we're faced with them, 
or when they come into our area. Uh, the first thing that our bodies try to do is prevent the toxin from getting in to begin with. We call that barrier. Uh, if the toxin actually gets in, we try to do something called elimination, quickly eliminate it. So the first step is either barrier or elimination. And as an example, our skin is a barrier. Uh, the hairs in our nasal passages are a barrier. Even your digestive tract is a barrier to entry because what most people don't understand is for the most part when things are inside the digestive tract, they're not quote unquote in your body. Uh, and a healthy uh, intestinal tract, a healthy colon is a barrier to entry for many toxic compounds. These include heavy metals, volatile organic compounds, uh, things like nitrosamines from cooked meat, which is a uh, risk factor for colon cancer. Because the colon and the intestinal tract is so good at trying to prevent those nitrosamines from coming in, uh, they can actually increase the risk of, uh, of digestive and uh, especially colon cancers. Um, but then we have uh, barriers and then we have elimination. Some toxins are easily sequestered in the body and put, forced out quickly uh, through a process of elimination. So that's the first thing. A toxin is either prevented from getting in or quickly eliminated. If a toxin gets in regardless and is not eliminated, the next step is called transformation. This is a liver process where the liver takes the toxin and changes it. It either adds something to it or takes something away from it. It transforms it to make it more water soluble and so easier to excrete where it's excreted simply through the kidneys and the bladder. Uh, there's over 27 different transformation pathways. Uh, they all require a healthy liver, and many require substrates, some other com uh, compound, to allow that transformation to take place. Uh, for example, uh, we just talked about uh, uh, the, the headaches and, and that it may be hormone-mediated. Well, the way the liver helps balance hormones is through a uh, phase two human glucuronidation, which is a transformation pathway. And for glucuronidation to take place, you need two things. You need a healthy liver and you need glucaric acid. And we get glucaric acid from uh, fruit for the most part. For example, oranges are very high in glucaric acid. And uh, that's a part of the substrate for glucuronidation. And what glucuronidation is is where the liver takes excess hormones from the body, transforms them, and allows you to eliminate them quickly. And that balances hormone levels. And what you should understand is it's not just natural hormones, pesticides, herbicides, uh, toxins, uh, for example, from plastics uh, are called xenoestrogens, and these are compounds that act like hormones in the body. And we know that if we have too many hormones, especially certain types of hormones, it can increase our risk for hormone-sensitive cancers. That would be prostate and testicular cancer in men, uterine, cervical, and breast cancer in women, uh, and even ovarian cancer in women. And so we want to try and, and balance those hormone levels through healthy liver function and glucuronidation. So what does that tell you? You need a healthy liver, of course, you can take care of that, but you also should be eating fruit as part of your diet, and especially, uh, you know, add oranges as part of that fruit in your diet. Um, so that's transformation, the, the healthy liver process of detoxification. Now, if you can't prevent a toxin from getting in, you can't eliminate it, and you can't transform it, the only other choice is sequestration. And that's where the body tries to hide the toxin in what is basically metabolically inert or inactive tissue. Uh, that's like uh, the bone, fat cells, uh, the fat around nerves, places where the toxin can do as little damage as possible. Now, because our exposure is much higher than our ability to excrete, all of us are sequestering toxins on a daily basis. And the amount of sequestered toxins in your body is called our body burden. That's the, the amount of toxins we have stored. And there's a pretty good website, bodyburden.org, bodyburden.org, which describes this process. Now, the problem is there's really no way to tell what anyone's body burden is. Well, there is one way. It's a cremation, and I, I don't recommend it. Uh, you can only do it once, I'm told. <laughs> <laughs> hey, um, Rick. Yes. Uh, some some comments about your voice being a little gobbled. I don't know if your your clothes are rubbing against the mic or something, but you, you no. In fact, that. when you were talking, you were a little choppy too. So I don't know if it's uh, something with the webinar, but I'm on a landline. Mm. Oh, okay. I'll try to speak right. distinctly. Can you hear me clearly? Yeah, I can hear you clearly, uh, but yeah. I, I I can understand they they said it was a little, a little gobbled. But anyway. Uh, Hey, can you increase the volume as possible? What's that? Do you increase the volume of your of your presence? Is there a way to inc increase your your sound? Your, My phone I mean, turn uh, as high as it can get. Okay. All right, that's fine. We'll, we'll, we'll just go with it. I can just turn on. I have this voice enhancement thing on my phone. I just turned that off. Let's see if that helps. Okay. Do I sound better now? 
Yeah, you sound good. I sound more authoritative. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that too. <laughs> okay. Um, well, as I said, there's really no way to tell what your body burden is except by cremation, and this has been done, you know, many times where we've uh, had uh, people who've died. I didn't donate their bodies to science. We've cremated those bodies and measured the amount of toxins in them. And what we found is through the years, it's getting worse and worse. Uh, as we create more and more environmental toxins, uh, and as uh, generation by generation goes by, people are born with toxins, you know, that's been passed on from their, from their mothers uh, in the womb. And uh, every generation since the beginning of the industrial age has been more toxic than the previous one. And we've seen this uh, clinically. Um, now, the problem is we can't tell as living beings what exactly our body burden is. So there's lots of studies being done, hair analysis, uh, urine analysis, challenge testing, uh, uh, even serum testing to try and find what sort of toxins might be resonant uh, in your bodies. And from there, we can kind of extrapolate uh, what is being uh, excreted and what is uh, still being stored in your body. Now, the name of the game here, and this is what I tried to tell, tell you before when we talked about headaches, the name of the game is competition. Many different toxins compete with healthy compounds uh, for, for use. And when that happens, natural products, natural processes are impeded. And I, uh, I did this last time as an example. I'm going to give two examples of, uh, of processes that are impeded, usually by heavy metals. Uh, this slide shows a molecule of ATP, adenosine triphosphate. Zine triphosphate is the energy molecule in the body. This is the energy currency of the body. When you're, you need to do something, your body spends ATP to do it. And the way it works is this. Uh, this main body part of the molecule is called adenosine. Okay? Adenosine is a nitrogenous base. It's found in DNA. It's found all over your body. These are called phosphate groups. One, two, three. A phosphate group is simply phosphate. Surrounded, uh, phosphorus surrounded by oxygen. Now, phosphate groups are negatively charged. So normally, like charges repel. So you have one, two, three negatives all lined up in a row. That makes this last bond a very high-energy bond. It's negatives that just want to burst apart. Now, what stabilizes that bond is magnesium. Magnesium binds. Magnesium is positively charged, and it displaces the negative charge of that bond. In fact, active ATP is called MGATP, magnesium ATP. Now, when you need to utilize that energy, the magnesium releases, that bond breaks, and it winds up, you wind up with ADP, adenosine diphosphate, a free phosphate group, and the energy is released into the environment where it's utilized for work. Uh, my best example here is I talk about an archer with a bow and an arrow. Imagine that you're pulling the string back on that bow. How much energy is stored in that string now? You have this huge amount of energy that you're holding with your fingers. It's like the magnesium stabilizing the ATP energy. Your fingers are holding the string. Well, now you notch an arrow to that string. You release it. The energy is released. The arrow flies, and work is accomplished. It's very much the same process. Um, now, the problem is that magnesium can be displaced, usually by heavy metals. In this case, we're looking at uh, mercury uh, being one of the largest contributors to ATP inhibition. So if mercury binds to that area, then magnesium can't get there. Mercury won't release the same way magnesium does, and so that ATP molecule becomes useless. So my point here is what if we had a way to bind to heavy metals and uh, remove that competition? And here's an example of a zeolite cage that I'm going to talk about uh, at length later. But here's the zeolite binding to the heavy metal. It removes it, and now magnesium can get to its active site. And once that happens, you now have free ATP, and you wind up with much more energy. A cleaner mm -hmm. body, a body that's free of these inhibitory toxins, uh, can readily produce and utilize the energy. Mm -hmm. That's good. Now, now, one more example I'm going to give here is zinc finger proteins. Uh, zinc finger proteins uh, are very well understood, but something that most people don't hear about unless they're in an advanced biochemistry class. Uh, but there, uh, there are 26 different zinc finger proteins in the in a human body. And they're, first of all, called zinc finger proteins because there's a zinc right in the middle of the protein. It holds the shape of that protein. Uh, zinc finger proteins are necessary for cellular division. Anytime your cells are going to divide, you're going to make new cells, you need zinc finger proteins to do so. Uh, for example, when you have a broken bone or a cut or a scrape, you need new cells to repair. Zinc finger proteins come in and help copy the DNA to allow those cells to divide and replicate. 
Another example is your immune system. When you're under attack by a bacterial infection or a viral infection, zinc finger proteins will go in and help copy those white blood cells to give you an army of white blood cells to fight that infection. This is one of the reasons you might suck on a zinc lozenge when you have a cold or take zinc vitamins when you have a cold. More zinc, more zinc finger proteins, more white blood cells, and you can fight the infection. Now, the problem is that zinc can be displaced, usually by arsenic. Now, understand this. The way proteins and enzymes work in our body is by their three-dimensional structure. You have to have the exact perfect three-dimensional structure to follow its function. We call the concept lock and key. If your key is not perfectly shaped, it won't fit the lock and won't turn. Have you ever gotten like a little uh, uh, ding on your key or wore down a little bit and it didn't work anymore? Yeah. You know yeah. what I'm talking about? I mean, you, you got to wiggle the key and try to make it work. Well, it's the same thing with these proteins and enzymes. If they're not exactly the perfect three-dimensional structure, they won't fit into their active site and they won't bind to what they're supposed to bind to and they won't function. Well, when arsenic replaces zinc in zinc finger proteins, arsenic is smaller than zinc, and the protein changes shape. When it changes shape, it stops working, it inhibits its function. And so uh, what happens when you have arsenic poisoning? Well, you, you uh, don't heal well, your healing process is slowed down, your immune system shuts down, and one of the major reasons is this inhibition of zinc finger proteins because of competition. Mm -hmm. So I think I mentioned last time too that um, um, zinc is is widely regarded as the most important mineral for the for the immune system. So exactly, and this is exactly why for any kind of healing process, zinc is absolutely mandatory. And there's a lot of things we do which inhibit zinc absorption as well. Uh, zinc absorption is competed with, uh, for example, with iron. So if you have a, a high iron diet, you wind up not getting a lot of zinc in your body. Uh, mm -hmm. zinc, comp zinc competes with a lot of other things for absorption. So it's the sort of thing that you should make sure you're eating foods that are high in zinc or at least taking some sort of multivitamin that contains zinc on a daily basis. Right. So li this leads us to the concept of, of active detoxification. And for now I've been using the concept of, you know, quote, unquote, a greener you. We talk about, you know, a greener environment, a greener home, you know, you want to drive a green car. Uh, but you really should start with yourself. Make yourself cleaner. Make yourself more environmentally friendly. And uh, you're going to be healthier, you're going to be happier, you're going to be able to do more for your environment. Uh, so the first thing is let's focus on ourselves. So how do we do that? The fact is there's lots and lots of ways to detoxify. Uh, most of us have heard of all sorts of quote-unquote detox programs, detoxification programs. But most of these that we've heard of in the past have the concept of wasting. How do you get things out of your body? Through sweat, through, uh, through going to the bathroom, through, uh, through laxatives or diuretics. Uh, all these concepts are, are, are what we call wasting concepts. Get things out of your body and the toxins will follow. So for example, infrared saunas help you sweat. Lymphatic drainage uh, drives things uh, out through the urine. Uh, colon cleansing, energetic body work, acupuncture, which is used for, um, for uh, getting over uh, addic addictions. Uh, electromagnetic therapy and homeopathic therapy and use of vitamins and herbs and, and uh, things like chlorella and algae to balance digestive uh, processes. 99% of these concepts are wasting concepts. Get things out of your body. And most of them are actually very good for you, very healthy, if you do them appropriately. But understand that all these modalities have three issues in common. The first is dehydration. Anytime you're losing a lot of fluids, losing a lot of things through sweat, through urination, through defecation, you're going to lose liquid along with it. So you dehydrate. So any time that you're actively detoxifying, you need to drink water, plenty of water. Coffee doesn't count. Vodka doesn't count. Scotch doesn't count. Tea doesn't so, count. So does. Water. You got to drink water. Water, water, water. Agua, agua, agua. Okay. <laughs> you have to drink water. That's the first. I guess form. soda doesn't count either, huh? Soda doesn't count, no. <laughs> Water. Now, uh, the second issue, and this is a little more, uh, a little more disturbing, is that many of these compounds uh, are addictive in nature. Uh, the body grows used to it, and uh, when you stop using them, uh, you have dysfunction or uh, some sort of syndrome. Uh, an example is any of these herbs that function as laxatives and or diuretics. Uh, a good example is senna leaf. Uh, Senna is used in a lot of these products. Senna is a natural laxative. 
Uh, and I'm not saying senna is bad. Senna-based teas have been used for hundreds of years of recorded uh, historic use. And uh, what senna-based teas do is they relax uh, the natural uh, muscular contractions and digestive tract, peristalsis. And um, when that happens, uh, everything kind of comes out. And it's really gravity-fed. So the concept is you would drink a cup of senna-based tea just before you go to bed, and you're going to lay down. And when you wake up in the morning, you stand up, uh, gravity takes over, and you have a moving experience, which is uh, always nice and uh, <laughs> certainly, certainly helps move things along. Now, the problem is that you shouldn't use it too much. If you use uh, senna-based product two times a week, three times a week, that's fantastic. It aids in digestive motility. It cleans you out. That's great. And it does detoxify. The problem is when people are using it two, three times a day, and they grow addictive to it, addicted to it, where when they stop using it, uh, they can't even undergo normal bowel movements. They, they can't, they uh, wind up with chronic constipation. In fact, there is a, a medical condition that is unique to people who are addicted to Senna-based products. Uh, it's called uh, distal bowel encopresis, uh, where you have chronic constipation followed by explosive diarrhea. Uh, and so this is uh, something you should be concerned about. So when you're using these cleansing products, make sure you use them appropriately, use them responsibly, you drink plenty of water. And uh, things like, like dandelion-based diuretics and senna-based uh, laxatives should only be used two or three times a week, and that's certainly healthy. Uh, the last issue um, with these concepts of wasting is the concept of dumping. See, once you start removing a lot of toxins at one time from the body, the toxins that are in sequestration start to come out more efficiently, quicker. Uh, this concept is known as dumping. So in other words, you're pulling out all these toxins, you're urinating out, sweating them out, defecating them out, and, and what happens though is all those toxins then start to come out quickly from sequestration, and you wind up resuspending heavy metals and volatile organic compounds in the serum, throughout your bloodstream, throughout your lymph, and you wind up with a lot of uh, toxicity issues based on that. Uh, you might hear someone say that you're going through a detox syndrome or a healing crisis. Uh, they have lots of names for it, but in essence, What's happening is the toxins that were more or less safely sequestered in your body are now in circulation causing damage. Uh, and so you should be aware of that. Uh, for the most part, this is not a dangerous thing. It's just an incredibly uncomfortable process. And it's the process of detoxification. Uh, there are ways that you can detoxify that don't lead to these dumping crises. And that's what I'm going to talk about next. But understand, if you are going through a detox, this is something that can happen, this sort of... Uh, this sort of uh, natural healing crisis. Uh, so the newest concept in detoxification is the use of chelators, chelation therapy. Now what chelation therapy is, is using some compound that will bind to a toxin, make it more water soluble, and so therefore you can excrete it more readily. In fact, if you think about the lecture so far, it's really much like transformation, the second detox step. Uh, where the liver usually takes the toxin and transforms it to be more water-soluble and you can get rid of it. In this case, you're using an outside compound, some exogenous compound that you take either orally or through IV, and it binds the toxins, makes them more water-soluble, and you excrete them. Now, the problem with most chelators is that they're nonspecific. They tend to be only charge-specific. And so, uh, as an example, let's look at a compound called EDTA. EDTA has been used for well over 100 years. It really rose in popularity during the 1940s, during World War II, when a lot of soldiers were working in motor pools with lead, uh, lead batteries. A lot of sailors were painting ships with lead paint. And so there's a lot of lead poisoning in World War II. Well, EDTA has a plus two charge. I'm sorry, has a minus two charge. Lead has a plus two charge. So EDTA will bind to lead readily. Plus two and minus, you wind up with a neutral compound and simply urinate it out of the body. And so it's great for getting rid of lead. The problem is it takes anything with a plus two charge. So EDTA will remove calcium and magnesium as well. And so when you're chelating with something like EDTA, you have to keep adding calcium and magnesium back into your body uh, to replace it. And what happens is eventually you have what I call diminishing returns, where the only thing you're chelating out is the calcium and magnesium you keep adding back in. And so you, you never really can get rid of all that heavy metal. Now, uh, the newest concept in chelation therapy is the use of zeolites. Uh, zeolites are natural compounds. They're formed of volcanic eruptions. When the volcano erupts, the lava and the ash goes into salt water, 
And over thousands of years, through pressure, through this activity, it forms these crystal structures, these cage-like structures that are known as zeolites. Uh, zeolites uh, are also negatively charged, making it one of the few negatively charged minerals found in nature. Uh, because of its negative charge and its cage-like structure, zeolites have the ability to draw to themselves and trap within themselves positively charged compounds. Depending on which zeolite, it will filter or trap different things. Um, based on the pore sizes, based on the aggregate charges through the zeolite, and based on what we call exchangeable ions, what is already in the zeolite or found in the zeolite in nature. Now, if you, when you start looking into zeolites, you're going to find that there's 49 different naturally occurring zeolites based on the crystal structures that the zeolites form. Now, there's hundreds and hundreds of synthetic zeolites because zeolites are so good at drawing to themselves and tra trapping within themselves certain things. Scientists have long started tailor tailoring zeolites for their own purposes, for so all sorts of filtration media and things like that. And so you'll find... Uh, literally hundreds and hundreds of synthetic zeolites. But looking in nature, there's only 49 naturally occurring zeolites. And we divide them based on the sort of crystal structures they form when they form large crystals. Uh, the first family we call needle-like or acular zeolites. And here I've given an example of scolocyte. Uh, when needle-like zeolites form crystals, they look like little pins. And um, in fact, asbestos is a acular or needle-like zeolite. Uh, when you breathe in asbestos, those little pins will stick in the lungs, and they can cause asbestosis and mesothelioma. Now, I'm telling you this because I'm talking about zeolites for use in health products, and we don't use any sort of acular or needle-like zeolites in any sort of health products, although they are used in filtration media. The next type of zeolite we call equant, or grape-like zeolites, and that's where the uh, crystal structures are larger. They tend to be very blocky crystals. Uh, in fact, here's an example here of a chabazite. Um, these uh, zeolites are used in filtration, and air, air filters, and water filters. In fact, if you've ever seen what's called a salt lamp, it looks like a large piece of rock salt with a lamp in it. Uh, that's usually chabazite, and when you heat it, the heat from the lamp activates cationic exchange, and it will draw in odors from the air. And so those heat lamps are used as deodorizers uh, because of their zeolite effects. The last family of zeolites are called sheet-like zeolites. And the example I give here is clinoptilolite. Uh, sheet-like zeolites are considered to be completely safe and non-toxic. They've been used in human health for, for hundreds and hundreds of years. And in fact, clinoptilolite is the most uh, abundant and most well-studied sheet-like zeolite. Um, in fact, uh, clinoptilolite is considered really one of the greatest chelators out there. It's been used for more than 800 years in traditional medicine. It's highly wow. abundant. It's found all over the place. It's considered to be completely safe and non-toxic, and it has an incredible affinity for toxic metals and volatile organic compounds, but almost no affinity for healthy compounds, including electrolytes like calcium and magnesium. Uh, clinoptilite has been used for more than uh, 40 years in the United States in water filters and air filters. It's been used in kitty litter and pool filtration. Uh, it's been used in animal feed to make healthier uh, animals. Uh, preventing things like aflatoxicosis from animal feed, which is a, a toxin that comes from fungus that can be found in animal feed all over the place. Uh, and it's been used in fertilizers uh, to prevent toxins and heavy metals from getting into our food supply. And I'll tell you this, this is uh, something that I'm pretty proud of. Uh, my son is in fifth grade, and he had to come up with a science project for the science fair this year. And he decided, because he had heard uh, about natural cellular defense, and he uses it all the time, he decided to see what would happen if he fed plants natural cellular defense. And so he grew, uh, he had uh, two cards that were impregnated with sunflower seeds. Uh, so it's a, from the same card, he simply cut it in half, and he planted uh, using the same soil. Everything's the same. Everything's equal. He planted one card in uh, one cup and the other card in another cup. And the only difference between the two is he's adding um, a few drops of uh, the NCD to the plant on a daily basis. And now it's been uh, just over two weeks, and the one that the NCD is being added to is growing really, really tall. It's already about five inches tall, and the other one is barely germinating. It's barely out of the uh, out of the ground. And so the, the only thing that well, I think it has to do with cationic exchange. It allows it to be a better nitrogen source because uh, the ammonium, which is na ammonia, which is naturally in the topsoil that's used in planting, is more available. Uh, as you pull in other metals. 
So again, it's competition. It prevents competition with other uh, metals and other things that could compete for nitrogen. Mm. Um, and that's what's used. That's why uh, 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 zeolites have been used in fertilizers. They preload them with ammonium, which is NH4, as a nitrogen source. And when you put them into uh, into farms, into uh, into plants, the ammonium is given off, so it's a nitrogen source and healthy for plants as a fertilizer. At the same time, it's pulling in toxins and heavy metals from the soil, which prevents them from damaging the plant, but also prevents them from getting into our food supply. So it makes our food healthier. And so that's why they've been using these, uh, these zeolite fertilizers for more than 40 years. I just think it's mm. fascinating to see it in action with my son's uh, science project. Yeah, I was going to ask, did he win? Did he win? No, it's, it's still ongoing. He's got uh, four more weeks. And then, okay. then uh, they're going to have a science fair. But uh, he's been taking pictures every day. He's been measuring. He's been, he's, it's very, really great to see the scientific process. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Well, I wish them the best. Now, the problem we found with naturally occurring zeolite is that uh, when we talk about using it for human nutrition, is the first problem is that the cages tend to be very large. When you actually look at the grains of zeolite, when they're powdered, the actual grains are 40 microns or larger, as much as 250 microns. Now, that sounds like pretty small to the average person, but when we're talking about ingesting it and getting it into the bloodstream, it's too big to be of use outside the digestive tract. And this would be really like ingesting sand. And it would just stay in the digestive tract and clean out the digestive tract without being absorbed and therefore being a systemic detoxifier. Um, in fact, uh, many zeolite products have been on the market prior to this. Uh, most of them were powder zeolite. There was a German product called Megamin, a Swiss product called Zetox, and a US product called Estefan, another one called Destroxin. And all of them knew that their product didn't get into the body. It simply stayed in the digestive tract. And the main claims were the treatment of digestive disorders, diarrhea, uh, constipation, all sorts of digestive dysfunction, because the cages were too big to offer systemic detoxification. Uh, the second problem is that clinoptolite naturally has a lot of toxins in it, because as toxins move through the mine site, they're going to be pulled in by the zeolite, because that's what zeolites do. They pull in toxins. And so you can think of the zeolite as nature's detoxifier. Um, so because it's so full of all those toxins, it really has very limited surface area. Now, I'm not saying that other zeolites are dangerous because they have these toxins in them. The zeolite is so good at holding on to those toxins that even though, even if you ingest them, they're not going to be given off as, uh, from the zeolite because the zeolite is going to hold on to them. Uh, but if the space is all taken up with those high affinity metals, how much more room is there to detoxify a body? There's very little room, therefore very little usable surface area. And so the concept we came up with was to clean out the zeolite to try and offer much more room. Now here's a picture of a zeolite mine site. I'm showing this for two reasons. First, understand that these, at the bottom, these are people. These are normal sized people at the mine site. And so you can mm -hmm. see all of this is clinoptolite. This one mine site has over 300 million tons of clinoptolite. So it's, it's highly abundant. This is just one of seven mines that we certified in the United States. Mm. So we have plenty and mm. plenty and plenty of product. So first I'm showing you how abundant it is. The second thing is I want to show you how available it is. When water flows down this mountainside, when air blows past it, it's got toxins in the water and in the air, they're going to be trapped by the zeolite. And in fact, when we do our activation process and we clean out the zeolite, we analyze what comes off it. And just about uh, nine months ago, we made a batch of the natural cellular defense, and we uh, took some, some stuff off the zeolite that we couldn't identify. Uh, with our machinery, with our database, we didn't know what this stuff was. So we sent it out to a third party, and it came back as diesel fuel exhaust, which means that the actual mining equipment, the trucks that they used to mine the zeolite, giving off the exhaust, that exhaust was being trapped by the zeolite they were mining. It's, it's very fascinating to me because it's telling you that no matter where the zeolite is, no matter how clean the environment is, even the mining process itself, is, is the toxins are going to be trapped by the zeolite. Right. Hmm. So what we have is a, a manufacturing process I'm going to go through briefly. Then I'm going to start talking about the mechanism of action when it comes to how the zeolite works uh, in heavy metals, but also, as we talked about before, in volatile organic compounds and other toxins. Um, but we have a... a two basic things we do to the zeolite. We micronize it, which means we make it smaller, and then we activate it. 
So the micronization process, we start with raw zeolite, and this is zeolite straight from the mine. It comes in these sacks a ton at a time. And the raw powder is a very rough, granular powder with a particle size of 40 to 250 microns. We then put it through a process. It's a chelcination attached to a centrifuge where we, we keep spinning it, and the, the largest particles go to the edges, and then we re-chelcinate it. Chelcinate is a grinding process that is just painstaking. It's labor intensive. And what we do is we reduce the zeolite from 40 microns to less than 5 microns. So that's the cutoff point at this point. Uh, there's no powder left that's more than 5 microns. And so you see it goes from a very rough powder to a very fine, almost aerosolized powder. In fact, that's one of the reasons we put it in a liquid, because it's much more stable in liquid. If we left this as a powder or in capsules, uh, much of it will be lost in the manufacturing process. I mean, if you just blow on that pile, it would disappear. It would go right up into the air. Uh, it's mm. practically aerosolized. Mm. Uh, the next step is we add it to ultra-purified water in a reaction vessel, and we start to heat it. And what you can see here is the apparatus we have for capturing everything that comes off uh, the zeolite. Because uh, we want to measure what is coming out of this, what is naturally found in the mine, and want to track it from batch to batch to see what was in that zeolite and what you might see in other products that come from that mine site. So what you see here is uh, as the first heat uh, comes into the solution, we start to see volatile organic compounds driven off. Uh, these are petroleum-based products like that diesel fuel exhaust I talked about. Uh, that's uh, benzene, dichlorobenzene, dioxin, dioxane, uh, things that are, are trapped in the zeolite that will come off just with a little bit of heat. And you see it bubbling off the top of the zeolite. So all that stuff is in there. Even though you didn't see it in that purified powder, uh, and you didn't see it when you first add it to the water. It comes off when you start to heat it and, and stir it. Now the next step is we add some, uh, some natural acids, some weak acids to the solution, which start to drive out the heavy metals. Uh, as we start driving out heavy metals and high affinity metals, you'll see these start to come out as well. Uh, then they quickly oxidize uh, in this environment. Once they oxidize, they can't be pulled back into the zeolite. Uh, so in fact, we wind up with lead oxides and, and, uh, and mercury oxides. And once that happens, they're basically rusting. They're easier to remove from solution. And so that we do this process over and over and over again until we see nothing more coming out of the zeolite. Um, the last step is a filtration process, both air force and vacuum filtration. And it yields an average particle size of about one micron. So the only thing left in the zeolite bottle, in the natural cellular defense bottle, is the purified activated zeolite that's about one micron or less uh, and highly active because we've emptied out uh, any of the high affinity atoms and, uh, and compounds. And then we've also allowed calcium magnesium back into the solution because the positive charges stabilize the zeolite. And so uh, when you take the product, you're actually getting a little bit of calcium magnesium with the zeolite. When that calcium magnesium is given off, it pulls in those toxins and heavy metals from the body. Now understand that uh, there are other zeolite products on the market. Uh, before we launched the Natural Cellular Defense, there were no liquid zeolite products on the market. But we've been so successful uh, in, in producing the product and marketing the product and the, the uh, benefits that people have gotten, just like you talked about, one person with headaches. We've seen people with uh, all sorts of dysfunction, and even people that didn't have clear dysfunction. They seem to be happy, they seem to be healthy, but they started taking the product and they realized that they were thinking clearer, they were sleeping better, they had more energy during the day. Just little things they start to notice when they detoxify. Uh, we've been so successful in getting that uh, information out that immediately it starts to drive competition. People say, well, we can make that too. And of course yeah. you can, because zeolite is cheap. You can buy zeolite right. for about $700 a ton. It's very yeah. cheap. The process is what's expensive. This labor-intensive process that it, you know, uses very expensive equipment, and uh, that's why the product actually starts to cost more. But when we start seeing these uh, co competitors, you have two types of competitors. You have simply people that put zeolite in water or simply zeolite powder, and then you have the people that add humic and fulvic acid to the product. Uh, humic acids are from uh, humic earth or compost. If people have ever put compost together, they know it's called humus or peat. Well, humic acids are simply compost. And fulvic acids are a humic fraction. They're actually from humic acid. And the reason that's added is, uh, you know, a lot of people talk about the health, uh, how 
how uh, organic humic acids are, we have to understand what decays plant material. It's bacteria and fungus. So humic acid, by definition, contains fungus and bacteria. It can't. It, it can't not contain fungus and bacteria because of what it is. It's decaying plant material. Uh, some people will take the humic and fulvic acid and either gamma irradiate it to kill the bacteria and disable the fungus, or they'll boil it. But in that case, then it does destroy a lot of the enzymes that are present there. Uh, so what these people do is they say, we take the, uh, the, the whole earth, the PD earth, and we add it to the product. But understand, because of that, it always has bacteria and fungus in it. Uh, the reason they add it is because the larger zeolites, those large micron zeolites, those large cages, will fall out of solution. So when you have a bottle, you'll see that it just starts clogging up the top of the bottle or falling to the bottom of the bottle. By adding the uh, highly charged humic and fulvic acid, it keeps it up in solution. It's sort of a, a trick uh, to keep the zeolite floating in the bottle. Uh, and that's why they, they started adding that. But if you look at the natural cellular defense versus the other products, natural cellular defense is the small micron, so it actually is absorbed into the bloodstream. No other product can make that claim. Uh, they're too large, they're only active in the digestive tract. Because we activate the product, we're free of heavy metals and volatile organic compounds. They have heavy metals and volatile organic compounds. We have no bacterial growth or fungal byproducts. The other ones may have, uh, and certainly with, with uh, humic and fulvic acid, they have noticeable bacterial products. In fact, uh, the first product that came out in direct competition, natural cellular defense, uh, was a product that had uh, a little bit of zeolite and a lot of humic and fulvic acid. The first thing we noticed is that when people took it, it turned their teeth green, which I would consider a negative. Uh, I don't know about you guys. I don't know. I don't know what society green teeth are positive. Uh, but the uh, the worst part of it is five people did get hospitalized with uh, liver problems related to aflatoxicosis, which uh, aflatoxins are produced by two types of fungus, Aspergillus parasiticus and Aspergillus flavus which are found in nuts, beans, and all sorts of like animal feed, but certainly found in humic acid. And so these aflatoxins can cause sometimes irreparable harm to the liver. And so that product was pulled off the market, and for a little while it gave zeolites as a concept, a black eye. But we had to tell them it had nothing to do with the zeolite, it had everything to do with the humic acid that was being added to it. Now because we clean out the zeolite and we activate it, we have a huge amount of surface area. One gram of the activated zeolite, which is about 100 drops in the natural cellular defense, has 90 square feet of surface area. And you have to ask yourself, how many atoms of mercury can I fit on 90 square feet? You know, it's a huge amount of space, which is why a very little bit seems to go a long way for detoxification. And then lastly, we've already conducted 14 clinical studies. We have three more studies underway and five more studies in the planning stage. Uh, there's really only a few studies in the, in the powdered forms out there and no clinical studies in uh, suspensions or with humic or fulvic acid. Now that leads me to what the zeolite actually looks like. Um, uh, this is a simple model of the zeolite, and I'm going to go a little deeper into it. But what I wanted you to see is the, uh, the pore sizes. Uh, the, you have 7.5 by 4.2 angstroms are the large pores, and 4.2 by 4.2 angstroms are the smaller pores. At this point, I'm actually going to pull up, and I hope this comes out well, it's going to be a movie, here we go, that shows the uh, zeolite. Here we go. Is that coming through okay for you guys? Uh, yes. Okay. Now this shows the zeolite cage, and it's going to start moving around, so I'll start explaining it. But uh, this shows the repeating crystal structure of a zeolite cage. And you have a 10-sided ring followed by an 8-sided ring, which repeats over and over again. 10 side, 8 side, 10 side, 8 side, uh, in all directions. Um, this repeating crystal structure is a rigid structure. It doesn't swell, it doesn't change shape at all, whether it gets wet, whether it gets heated, whether it gets cold. It's a rigid crystal structure. And what you can see is it allows for pores, for channels, to move through the entire crystal. Now, if you look at this, this is uh, only about, on a side, about 1.5 nanometers on a side, this box that you're looking at. Uh, which means that um, a one micron crystal is really about a thousand by a thousand by a thousand of the picture you're looking at, or about one billion of the picture you're looking at is a one micron cage. Uh, so that tells you how many holes will be present in just one one micron cage of the uh, of the zeolite, the natural cellular defense. Uh, additionally, some people tell us that 
we, uh, we break the zeolite. We destroy the zeolite in our process, and that's just not possible. Zeolites are practically indestructible. It takes uh, degrees of greater than 900 degrees, temperature of 900 degrees, more than five hours to break a zeolite. What we do is we simply make a smaller crystal structure. It's much like a diamond. When you break a diamond down, it's still a diamond, still the same crystal structure. It's just smaller. It's diamond powder, which still has all the same properties as a whole diamond. We lower the, uh, the, uh, the size of the zeolite. We're simply making smaller crystals with the same properties, but now they can get into the body. So what I've done here now is I've applied a surface because the wireframe structure really doesn't show you what its space is available. So now I've applied a surface to the zeolite. This actually shows what space is available for things to move into and out of the zeolite. And what you're going to see is that there are four uh, surfaces, uh, there are four available surfaces for absorption. And there's two surfaces that have no pores whatsoever. Uh, so basically the front and back of this crystal have the large pore and the small pore. The two sides of the crystal show small pores throughout, and then two sides of the crystal are basically flat and have no surface accessibility. There's no availability for things to move into and out of the zeolite. Now this is really important because you know what can and cannot fit into the zeolite. Now at this point we're imagining that we're a toxin and we're traveling inside the zeolite, and oh my god, ah, I'm being <laughs> black trapped. Hole. It's like I'm a black being hole, trapped. Right? And then you see it locking into the interlocking pore structure of the zeolite, and you're trapped. Mm. So now let's look at uh, what can and cannot fit in the zeolite. And this is really important because this tells us uh, what, why the zeolite is so specific for toxic heavy metals and really does not trap the, uh, the larger metals. So here we have an example. Uh, this example, uh, the size of this looks more like a mercury. So you can see the mercury fits in the small pore. It fits very well. And once it fits inside it, it simply moves deeper into the zeolite cage and gets trapped. Uh, but when you look at something larger, like uh, I think the example I give here is going to be a potassium ion, uh, you're going to find that it doesn't fit in the small pores at all. It's just too big but it can fit into the larger pores, the ten-sided ring of the zeolite cage. Uh, even then, it's a very tight squeeze. Uh, so this tells you that when you look at larger compounds, uh, which all the healthy things, all the things that are good for us, like calcium, magnesium, potassium, sodium, phosphorus, tend to be larger than the toxic heavy metals, mercury, lead, cadmium, arsenic, etc. cetera. Um, so the, the higher the charge, and the smaller the compound, the greater the affinity for the zeolite. And what I'm going to show here is a, uh, a simple ex explanation. I'm going to show uh, the large serum electrolytes against some of the smaller heavy metals. Uh, so here you can see potassium, sodium, magnesium, calcium. And they're larger with lower charges. And so it's harder for them to fit into uh, both pores. Uh, meanwhile, you have arsenic, mercury, and lead, which tend to be smaller with higher charges. Uh, and they fit into either pore very well, and because of their high charge, they stick very well to the zeolite. And I'd like to explain that for just a second. The higher the positive charge, the greater is going to stick to the zeolite. Remember I told you EDTA had a charge of minus 2, and so it bound to uh, lead with a charge of plus 2. Well, the average 1 micron zeolite cage has a charge of minus 15,000. It's a huge uh, net negative charge. And so the higher the positive charge of whatever atom is going to be attracted to it, the more it's going to stick to that strong negative charge. My example here is I talk about refrigerator magnets. Uh, we all have refrigerator magnets, and we all have that one magnet that slides down the refrigerator. It won't stick at all. Uh, it mm -hmm. won't hold one piece of paper. You have to put helper magnets around it to try and keep a piece of paper on your fridge. Well, that's like a low charge trying to attach to the zeolite. But then you have that super magnet that sticks and you can't budge it. Well, that's like a high charge attached to the zeolite. Uh, so the higher the charge, the greater it's going to stick to the zeolite cage. Now, the other thing we found is that volatile organic compounds tend to be absorbed to the cage as well. Now, I used to deny this because most volatile organics are too large to fit in the pores of the cage. But remember that there's two surfaces of the zeolite that don't have any pores at all. They're simply flat surfaces. Well, many volatile organic compounds are flat as well. Take benzene, for example. Uh, benzene is highly toxic. It's found as a, uh, a breakdown product of petroleum. Uh, in fact, if you remember about uh, 12 years ago, we pulled 2 million bottles of Perrier off the shelves because of benzene toxicity. They had benzene in it. Well, that flat molecule can lay against the zeolite cage. 
Now, benzene is flat because it has three extra electrons that are shared among the six carbon atoms. When those three electrons start to move into the zeolite cage, that benzene ring takes on a slight positive charge. Because of that slight positive charge, it can actually draw another zeolite cage to the other side of it. Remember the negative zeolite cage? And it traps the benzene between the zeolite cages, kind of like a toxic sandwich. Uh, very interesting concept. Wow. And is is that how it works with, uh, with uh, dioxins and other... Uh, exactly. Any of, any of these volatile organic compounds, dioxin, dioxane, the dichlorobenzene, the, uh, the phthalates, all of them bind in a very similar fashion. And I tell you, for, for over a year, as I started this research, I denied that. I said, it doesn't make sense that these things can be trapped so easily by zeolites. Meanwhile, uh, every, time we had a, um, every time we got a batch of zeolites in, uh, raw zeolite, it would, have that, uh, it would have volatile organic compounds in it. So here's the question. Is there anything good for us that has that structure, that same flat structure? And the answer is no. That flat structure is what makes those compounds so dangerous. Those refrigerant mm -hmm. breakdown products like dichlorobenzene, those pesticide breakdown products like dioxins, and those, uh, those petroleum breakdown products like the benzene. The fact is those flat compounds can slide into our cell membranes. They can fit between the phospholipid uh, molecules in our cell membranes. They go to our DNA and they intercalate into the DNA. They slide between the turnings of the double helix and they intercalate and they trap themselves. They lock themselves into that double helix and they can cause cancer that way. So that flat structure is what makes them so dangerous. By the same token, that flat structure is what allows them to be trapped by the zeolite. I think mm -hmm. it's fascinating chemistry. Mm -hmm. you know, it, mm -hmm. it, really, it really is amazing. So right. as you look, I already talked about this stuff, but the, the higher the charge and the smaller the atom, the greater the affinity for the zeolite. The higher charge allows it to stick more readily to the zeolite. And then when we talk about uh, sizes, in this case, we're, we're going to start talking about the concept of cationic exchange. On this slide, we see that potassium has very few points of coordination. So does calcium. They're just too big. When mercury comes in, it fits deeper into the pores of the zeolite with more points of coordination. And when it does come in, it actually helps release the calcium. That process is called cationic exchange. As higher affinity metals come in, the lower affinity metals are released. So when we look at our specific uh, clinoptilolite, we found the average selectivity or reactivity series is mercury and lead are pretty much neck and neck, depending on concentration. Then we have an order of magnitude less, we have tin and cadmium, and then arsenic, aluminum, antimony, and then two orders of magnitude less, we have things like iron and nickel. And it's good to understand this, because iron is very low in the affinity series of the zeolite. Yet, if people have iron overloads, the zeolite team seems to do very well at lowering those iron levels. Now, for example, if you have uh, anemia or if you have normal iron loads, the zeolite's not going to change that at all. But people have hemochromatosis, which is an a iron overload, uh, the only way to treat that is through phlebotomy. They have to give blood every 6 to 8 to 10 weeks. Uh, to try and mm -hmm. balance those iron levels. We found mm -hmm. that when they take the zeolite, the zeolite alone is enough to pull out a lot of the excess iron, and many of these people don't even need to undergo phlebotomy anymore because the zeolite is balancing those levels. So and concentration has a lot to do with affinity. Does it totally remove the need for, for phlebotomy in such cases? Well, I've only known, it's all anecdotal, I, I only know two specific cases where people that I knew were undergoing phlebotomy every 8 to 10 weeks for hemochromatosis. Since they started using the zeolite, they've not needed to, uh, to, to give blood, to undergo phlebotomy. Um, and uh, the only thing they really did was add the natural side of defense. Now, mm -hmm. the next step would be for me to tell them to go off it and see how they feel and see if they, uh, the iron loads st start to come back up. We haven't done any clinical work in this field, but I think it's fascinating that uh, things that are lower in the affinity range, as you increase its concentration, it becomes higher in affinity. Okay? Now, this process so is uh, what the concept right. I had given before of cationic exchange. Now, I'm not, the sizes are not relative, so don't look by the sizes, because as you saw before, potassium, for example, would not fit at all into that smaller pore, and yet I have it fitting into a smaller pore. But right. I just want you to get the idea that cationic exchange occurs. So here's lead exchanging for potassium. Then we have mercury exchanging for calcium. 
ammonium exchanging for sodium, arsenic exchanging for calcium, and this process will go on over and over and over again until the highest affinity molecules are trapped and the zeolite is in essence full, which means it reaches a net neutral charge. Remember, just like any other chelator, EDTA minus two binds one atom of lead plus two. Now it's neutral, it simply gets excreted. Same thing with the zeolite. Once it's neutral, it simply gets excreted through the urine. None of the zeolite stays in the body. It's 100% excreted. The zeolite that gets in the bloodstream is excreted through the urine. That's about 70 to 80% of it. And the rest stays in the digestive tract and is excreted through the fecal matter. But 100% is excreted, usually in three to five hours, uh, depending on how active you are, your fluid intake, and how often you go to the bathroom. Uh, that's why we recommend that people use the zeolite three to four times a day so they have it in constant circulation throughout the day. It maximizes performance. Mm. And, and this is what this I already talked about. What's that? This, this, this doesn't affect the kidneys at all, and there's no uh, kidney toxicity with the zeolite. Huh? Now, that's a good point, because other chelators, like EDTA, cause a lot of damage to the kidneys and the bladder, and they do so for two reasons. Uh, the first, and probably the primary reason, is that you use a lot of it. A normal EDTA push uses about three grams of EDTA. So you have a lot of stuff going through your body at one time and starts to get blocked up in the kidneys. And that can cause a lot of damage and filtration. That's one issue. The second issue is that these chelators bind to a toxin, but that toxin is still available for reactivity. The EDTA doesn't sequester the toxin, doesn't wrap around it. It simply binds to one side of it. Uh, so that lead is still available to react in all sorts of ways. And so as it goes to the kidneys and the bladder, it can cause damage on the way out. The zeolite doesn't have either of those problems. We use much less of it, so it's not a concentration issue. And because the toxins are sequestered inside the zeolite, for all practical purposes, it's like they're already out of the body. And so they don't react as they go out through the kidneys and the bladder. On the contrary, we've actually seen people with chronic kidney stones and kidney issues do very well in the zeolite, because even though the zeolite doesn't like calcium, as an example, it still will uh, attract calcium. It will still move into and out of the zeolite very readily. It just doesn't get trapped there. As I just showed you with cationic exchange, uh, things like calcium and magnesium will move into and out of the zeolite, but since the affinity is so low, they'll simply get kicked out. So it doesn't remove them from the body, but it can help shuttle them around the body. So you wind up with better uh, serum electrolyte utilization and I've seen people with, uh, with uh, kidney stones that use the natural cellular defense, and within days those kidney stones are reduced simply because of cationic exchange of the calcium in the kidneys. Mm -hmm. Now this slide is what I just talked about before. It's the sandwiching of, uh, of, a, of ultra-organic between zeolite cages. So this represents dichlorobenzene, which is a refrigerant breakdown product, and on either side you see a zeolite cage. And this is where the research first started. This was published in 1996 in the journal Actic Crystallography and really showed exactly how these volatile organics are trapped uh, by the zeolite. Now, a lot of people have been talking about different things that the zeolite does. And uh, I want to first remark that uh, we can't make any claim as to the treatment or prevention of symptom or disease with a dietary supplement. What I'm going to share with you are some mechanisms that are proposed by researchers that have published different studies on uh, different zeolites and zeolite as historic use through history. Uh, the first thing I'm going to talk about is the possible effects as an antiviral uh, agent. Uh, there were two studies published uh, back in the 1990s that looked at herpes viruses and enteroviruses, viruses of the digestive tract and the use of zeolites as uh, some function as an antiviral agent. Now, when I first heard this, I was uh, pretty put off because the concept is that uh, the zeolites could trap a virus seemed ridiculous. Viruses <laughs> are huge. They're, they're monumentally huge when compared to the average zeolite cage. And so there's no way a zeolite could carry off a virus. It's like saying an ant could carry off a Mack truck. It just can't happen. Um, but then I started reading the potential arguments for its effect. And the way to understand this is first understand how viruses replicate. See, viruses don't make uh, whole copies of themselves. First, in, in this example, I have HIV as HIV replicates. But the virus first fuses to the uh, cell membrane. And it injects its uh, DNA or RNA, its, its uh, genetic material. 
that genetic material then takes part in our own genetic material. It's inserted uh, into our genetic material. So it kind of uh, hijacks our cellular machinery to make copies of itself. When it does so, it makes copies of all its viral proteins, these little pieces of viral proteins. Now, before those viral proteins can assemble into a new virus, a process known as self-assembly, another enzyme is, is created by the virus called viral protease. Viral protease is like a pair of scissors. It goes to the viral proteins and it snips them and cuts them, makes them smaller, and it actually uh, gives them a charge. So they wind up with positive and negative charges. And once protease is done, all those pieces now can come together. They're all the right size, the right charge, to come together in a process known as self-assembly to make a new virus that can exit the cell and infect new cells. Now, imagine this. Once viral protease has snipped and cut some of these pieces, well, now you have small, highly charged pieces, some of which can be trapped by the zeolite. Now, certainly proteins by themselves are pretty large to be trapped by the zeolite, but some highly charged ends of the proteins can fit into the larger pore on the zeolite cage, as I showed you before. Uh, certainly, a few atoms on the end of a protein can fit into a pore that's uh, the 4.2 by 7.5 angstroms across. And that being the case, some of those viral particles can be trapped by the zeolite and removed from the body. And when that virus forms and forms a whole new virus, it's missing pieces. Now, it might look like a virus, but it doesn't function like a virus. It's no longer a, uh, an active or viable virus. And I try to explain. Imagine that you see a car, and it looks like a car. You think it would function, but someone took all the spark plugs out. So it's not going to start. It's not going to run. It's a non-viable car. It's not going to work. And that's what the proposal was in these studies, when they saw that any actively replicating virus uh, seemed to shut down in the presence of the zeolite. Uh, they felt that this was the reason that uh, during active uh, replication, some pieces were being actively removed by the zeolite itself, and so you wound up with non-viable viruses. Now, we did some research when we first launched the product in hepatitis C. Uh, we chose hepatitis C for a variety of reasons. Uh, first and foremost, hep C patients usually go unmedicated, and so there was no other variable of medication that uh, could take, uh, take precedence over the zeolite. Additionally, hep C patients, are, their viral loads are checked every 12 weeks regardless. So it wasn't an additional blood test or additional work we were asking the patients to undergo. Um, and so uh, they're, they're really a perfect model for looking at viral replication. And so uh, we had patients use either the natural cellular defense or placebo over a period of 24 weeks. So they had uh, three blood tests at the beginning and then the, after 12 weeks and after 24 weeks. And uh, all the patients that were taking the natural cellular defense saw a, a really quick drop in viral loads uh, just using natural cellular defense. Uh, we also measured liver enzymes, and we saw their liver enzymes dropped as well. They stabilized as well. Uh, so, of course, that was anecdotal. It was in very few patients. It was uh, an uncontrolled experiment conducted in Los Angeles. But it did give us enough information to say that certainly it's safe for people with viral infections to utilize the natural cellular defense and utilize zeolites, and it may be effective. And this is something we'd like to look at in the long term. But our big problem is as a dietary supplement, we can never make a claim as a treatment or prevention of symptom or disease. So this is the sort of research that will be done adjunctive to other therapies for things like hepatitis C or HIV. Um, the best thing I can say at this point is if you have a virus, it's not dangerous to take the zeolite, and it may be highly beneficial. Mm. Good point. Now, uh, cancer has been looked at as well. Um, there have been no... Uh, cancer trials conducted on the zeolite, uh, although there, there were anecdotal reports several years ago about a trial conducted in Ohio with 65 end-stage end cancer patients, but I've never seen the original data, so I can't really hang my hat on that. There have been a variety of microarray studies and in vitro analyses done with uh, different zeolites and cancers. Now, this shows uh, what can happen when you take antioxidants, for example, uh, and other things uh, to try and, and inhibit uh, cell growth, cancer cell growth, or to induce apoptosis. Uh, apoptosis is programmed cell death. You see, when a cell dies, there's only really two ways for it to die, either apoptosis or necrosis. Uh, necrosis is where the cell kind of dies, shrivels up, and you wind up with a bunch of dead cells. That's where your skin turns black, for example, and, and you have to either have that tissue surgically removed or debride it. 
Uh, then you have apoptosis. That's where a cell knows that it needs to die. It's doing something wrong. It's, it's causing damage to the system. And so the cell process takes over and says, we need to kill ourselves. It's cell suicide. And the cell starts to produce things like uh, uh, peroxide and things like that that start to eat out the inside of the cell. And then it sends a signal out for a macrophage, a white blood cell, to come and consume it. What I love about apoptosis is whereas with necrosis you have dead tissue left, with apoptosis you simply have resolution. Which is the, the cells simply go away. Uh, they're completely digested. Um, so one of the ways we try to uh, kill cancer is to induce apoptosis. Well, understand that there are several genes in the human body called tumor suppressor genes. They're genes that are supposed to kill a cancer cell. They're supposed to induce apoptosis in a cancer cell. In fact, the only way for cancer to be successful is to turn off those genes. One such gene is called the P21 gene. P21 tumor suppressor gene uh, is a highly active anti-tumor gene, and yet for cancer to be successful, it's got to convince the P21 gene that there's nothing wrong. So the cancer goes out of its way to try and maintain the cellular environment so the P21 gene doesn't turn on. And yet what we found in microarray studies is that in the presence of the zeolite, the zeolite seems to turn on P21 and therefore activate uh, this uh, tumor, this uh, apoptosis to the P21 pathway. Um, there was uh, one study published which, uh, which gave an explanation of this. Understand that over 90% of the activity of the zeolite is extracellular. The zeolite's way too big to be able to slide into our cell membranes and get into our cells. So most of the activity of the zeolite is simply floating around extracellularly through the blood and the lymph and picking up toxins and removing them from the body. But cells that are damaged, cells that are cancerous, cells that have viruses in them tend to have very leaky membranes. And so we know that the zeolite can get into a cell that's under viral attack. It also can get into a cell that is cancerous. Uh, cancer cells are very hungry. They suck in everything from around them to use raw materials to be able to replicate and grow new cancer cells. Uh, so we find that when a zeolite uh, is attracted to a cancer cell, it undergoes endocytosis into the cell very quickly. So imagine this. Imagine you're a full zeolite cage, and you've got all these toxins, heavy metals, volatile organic compounds attached to the outside of you, and then you get pulled into one of these cancer cells. Well, it's like a toxic bomb being delivered inside the cell. It starts to destabilize the cell pretty quickly. It's probably a, 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 an architectural destabilization, which then wakes up the B21 gene and says, hey, something's wrong with this cell. I've got to kill myself. I think it's a really apropos mechanism because remember that cancers are primarily caused by external toxins, by carcinogens, which trigger the cancer production. And so the zeolite's picking up these carcinogens and delivering it into the cancer cell. It's like it's killing the cancer with what caused the cancer to begin with. I think it's happening. This is amazing. But like this I said, these, these are in vitro studies. These are not uh, studies in patients. But it is a, a pretty compelling mechanism for the way the zeolite might function against cancer. Uh, now, we are conducting studies. We're doing two studies now in cancer. We're in the recruiting process. Uh, but these are not studies for the zeolite to treat cancer. These are studies as adjunctive nutritional therapy in patients undergoing chemotherapy and radiation. The first study is 5,000 patients undergoing radiation therapy. Uh, we're going to give half the patients the, uh, the natural cellular defense and half the patients placebo. And what we'd like to see is the patients using natural cellular defense are healthier, they're happier, they have better outcomes. Uh, certainly, they have fewer side effects uh, associated with the therapy. The other group is more specific. It's 2,000 patients undergoing chemotherapy with an agent called cyclophosphamide. Cyclophosphamide is a horrible chemotherapy. It's very, very toxic. Uh, it's been used for over 60 years. It's very well understood, but it causes a lot of damage to the system. Not only normal things you associate with chemotherapy, like hair loss and sterility, uh, and nausea, chronic fatigue, uh, but it also gives a great increase in risk in the 10-year risk for leukemia. So the cyclophosphamide might cure the current cancer, but you can wind up getting leukemia down the road because of the therapy. Mm. With, with cyclophosphamide, what happens is when you take that drug, it breaks down into two separate compounds in the body. One compound is called formic mustard, and that seems to be the active constituent that, that fights cancer. The other compound is called acrolein. Acrolein doesn't fight the cancer, but it causes almost all the side effects of cyclophosphamide. So for years, they've been trying to dose patients just with formic mustard, but they couldn't do it. It can't be taken by itself. It's got to be a metabolite. Then they tried to find things that would inhibit uh, acrolein, and they still haven't found anything. 
Well, when some of our researchers were looking into this, they found that the acrolein had a very similar uh, structure to formaldehyde. Well, formaldehyde is absorbed very well by the zeolite. It's one of the volatile organics that we studied at the beginning. And so he did some quick in vitro work, and he showed that in the presence of the natural sour defense zeolite, it did not inhibit cyclophosphamide from breaking down to its two components, and it didn't bind to the formic mustard, but it bound very well to the acrolein. And so that was enough to really uh, to excite some researchers into doing a study in 2,000 patients. Half of them will get the natural side defense, and half will get placebo. And the concept is that if it truly does bind to the acrolein and remove it from the system, it will knock out at least 90% of the side effects usually associated with this highly toxic chemotherapy and therefore improve patient outcomes. So uh, this is something, again, we're not talking about treating cancer. We're talking about limiting the side effects from, uh, from chemotherapy and radiation, at the same time making a healthier person a lot of better outcomes. Are, they, are these studies, uh, is there any way someone can read this? These studies are still under wraps. Well, no, they're, they're actually still recruiting. We don't even have all our patients yet. Uh, I think we've started about maybe 500 patients in the radiation study and only about 100 patients with eclophosphamide. So it's ongoing recruiting, ongoing uh, ongoing analysis, but it's very sexy stuff. It, it's stuff that, you know, <laughs> people can uh, add something as simple as a liquid zeolite to their, their cancer therapy and see monumental improvement in outcomes as well as a great reduction in side effects. And what I try to tell people is, is we all know cancer patients. We all know people that have come to us and said, I was just diagnosed with cancer. And when they tell you they were diagnosed, they look great. They look perfect. There's nothing wrong with mm -hmm. them. You say, I know, mm -hmm. I can't believe you have cancer. You look great. And then eight weeks later, chemo and radiation, how do they look? Terrible. They look terrible. And the question is, did the cancer do that to them, or did the treatment do that? Mm -hmm. And the answer is simply is the treatment. And don't get me wrong. I mean, I did my Ph.D. work at uh, Duke Comprehensive Cancer Center. We worked on, on very harsh chemotherapies, and there was a place for those. Mm -hmm. But the fact is, chemotherapy and radiation is meant to kill you. It's trying to kill as many cells as possible, and hopefully you get a lot of cancer cells while you're doing it. And then right. you try to feed the patient, make them healthy again so they can bounce back from the toxins you just pump through them. If you could do anything to minimize that toxic effect, I think it would be invaluable. And that's what we're seeing right. now with the DLA. Right. Well, like you know, my, my background is in radiation oncology, and uh, we, we saw these, we, we treated the patients day in, day out, well, at least stage four, because I come from a culture where uh, education and awareness is just not that high, and so people would only come when they're absolutely debilitated. So um, we, we saw that a lot. And I, 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 as a matter of fact, that was one of the things that really made me want to find out how else to help cancer patients. And uh, for people folks on the, on the call, I just want to quickly say this, that uh, we are going to start a cancer men mentorship program, like an eight-week program in about a week or, t or so, where we'll be doing this every week to work with cancer patients and their families and their care, caregiver, care providers just to help cancer patients know what they need to know about uh, going through treatment and, and, and surviving and winning. And this is invaluable information that you're sharing here, Rick. I, oh, I hope we can talk, can talk about this some more later because this, is, this, this will definitely be a good addition to what I'm going to teach about. Oh, I'd be happy to. Well, the last thing I want to talk about is, uh, is the concept of balancing pH levels. And um, I, I can't tell you how important this is. Uh, but I'm going to take two steps back because I've been talking about cancer and viruses. And what I, what I really want to try and get across to everybody is that the zeolite really only does one thing. It takes these toxins out of the body, and it does so efficiently that the body starts to fix itself. And when these concepts about how it works in viruses and how it works in cancers is really just the same thing. This is not a panacea. This is not a cure-all. This is letting the body do what it's supposed to do. The body's supposed to turn on P21 in response to cancer. It's supposed to stop cancer. Uh, your body's supposed to inhibit viral replication. And the problem is we have all these toxins in the way that inhibit our body's natural processes. So as the zeolite starts to clean you out, starts to balance everything, then your body can fight infection. It can be healthy. It can replicate as it's supposed to. It can heal the way it's supposed to. And you're going to start feeling a, a lot better. So in that same vein, let's talk about pH. Now, uh, just as a primer in pH, uh, when you think about pH, just think about water. And water is H2O. So if you see at the bottom of this page, I have HOH, which is a better way to think of H2O. Now, H2O, HOH, breaks down in solution to an OH, which is a hydroxyl and carries a negative charge, and a positive hydrogen, which is known as a proton, positively charged. 
Now, the pH scale runs from 0 to 14. 7 is neutral. So 7 is you just have as, as many protons as hydroxyls. You have an equal amount of H and OH. That's neutral. When you wind up with more hydroxyls, more OH, then the pH goes up. That's called basic or alkaline. When you have more protons, positively charged hydrogen ions, the pH goes down, and that's acidic. Okay? Now, the uh, pH scale is logarithmic, which means every one uh, change, one, number, one digit change in pH is times 10. So a pH of 5 is 10 times more acidic than 6. A pH of 4 is 100 times more acidic than 6. It's times 10. So little changes in pH mean a lot. Just a little bit of change in pH can mean a huge difference in the cellular environment and, and how drugs function and how the body functions. Now, our body should have a physiologic pH of about 7.4, slightly alkaline. That's what we call a normal pH. That's where our enzymes are the right structure. Everything functions well. The immune system functions well. Viruses don't grow well in acidic pH, in an alkaline pH. Cancer won't grow at all in an alkaline pH. And so that's where our body is supposed to be. And we have dozens of mechanisms in our body to balance pH. I put a couple on here, these acid-base reactions. Uh, for example, at the top, simply looks at carbonic acid and uh, H2CO3. Well, this is, this is the way we breathe. The way we breathe helps balance our pH. If we're breathing heavy, if we're getting tired, if, if our body is off, it's, it's too uh, acidic, we'll start to produce more CO2 to drive it toward uh, uh, carbonate, to drive it to the left. If uh, our pH is too alkaline, we'll produce less CO2 to drive it to the right. And so the whole concept is even the way we breathe helps balance the acidity in our body, helps, helps balance our, our pH. And yet we still screw it up through our poor diet, through lack of exercise, through certain, st uh, certain disease states like diabetes, we wind up with, uh, with acidic pH. It starts to drop down. Well, in acidic pH, viruses replicate better, bacteria flourishes, uh, cancers flourish, yeast, like systemic candida infections will flourish, and the immune system doesn't work well, and even our drugs don't work well because drugs are tested at physiologic pH. Once you start to drop that pH, your, your medication doesn't work as well. And so we need to get that pH back up. We need to make it more alkaline. Now, the zeolite seems to balance pH through a variety of mechanisms. The first is that toxins themselves, especially heavy metals, function as what we call Lewis acids. They function like acid in the body. When we start to reduce those, when we start to remove those heavy metals, it actually reduces the acidity in our body uh, because of chemical charge. So that's one thing. Second thing is some acids are directly removed by the zeolite. For example, lactic acid will bind to the zeolite and can be shuttled around and regulated by the zeolite itself. And then lastly, what causes acidity? These positively charged hydrogen ions, these protons. Now, they're very small. I mean, it's one, it's one proton. You know, it's very small. So, but it is positively charged, so it will move into and out of the zeolite. It has very low affinity. It's really not going to get stuck by the zeolite, but imagine concentration. If the zeolite cage is floating past an area that's very high in acidity, and this is where I love my poetry, there's a preponderance of protons. So wherever there's a preponderance of protons, some of them will migrate into the zeolite cage, and it'll lower the acidity of that area. So it becomes what we call a geographic buffering agent. Wherever there's a lot of acidity, the zeolite's going to reduce some of the acidity in that area. And so we do see it very well raising pH. We finished a study in 60 patients. These were all patients that uh, had, a, had uh, alkalinity problems, uh, diabetics, cardiac patients, irritable bowel patients. And uh, we saw them all uh, increase serum, urinary, and, uh, and salivary pH. The most impressive were the diabetics. Most diabetics suffer from what we call diabetic ketosis, uh, and they all have uh, very acidic uh, serum. And we found that when they took the zeolite, even just after seven days or so, we saw their salivary and urinary pH spike, and we saw their serum pH come up slowly. Um, and that makes them healthier, that makes them react better to their medications, and that makes for an overall better patient experience. Mm. That's good. Now, uh, when we, we talk about pH, I, I want to make uh, a couple of uh, comments. Uh, my business partner is Dr. Stuart Lonke, who's a, a pulmonologist in the Los Angeles area. And uh, he's been using natural cellular defense for a few years in his practice. He sees a lot of patients that are, have occupational exposure to toxins, and he loves using the natural cellular defense to detoxify these patients. But uh, he had one person come in, and this is, uh, 
I think, uh, an indicative story of some of the way people think about dietary supplements. But uh, this woman had a son who was epileptic, and he had been on, um, I think, Depakote as an anti-seizure medication. And uh, she had said that the Depakote stopped working. You know, he, w he was having seizures, and he, she wouldn't know what to do. Well, she started using natural side defense, and his seizures stopped. He stopped having seizures. So she came back, and what she said is, wow, you know, the, this, uh, this product stopped my son's epilepsy, it cured epilepsy. And that's not what it did at all. Depakote is one of those medications that's very uh, keen on pH changes. You need to keep that alkalinity up to, to make sure the drug works appropriately. So what the natural side of defense simply did is regulate the pH, raise it to more alkaline levels, so the drug was more effective. So this is something you should be aware of. If you're going to use a product like natural side of defense, you're going to have a healthier body. Chances are, if you're on medications, some of those medications are going to work better. So you might be able to lower some of the doses or even come off of some of your medications because of that change. Right, right. Now, all that being said, uh, if anyone wants to try the natural side of defense, uh, we do recommend that everyone start with what we call our detox dose, which is 10 drops three times a day for 30 days. And that, in essence, is going to clean out most of your circulating toxins, your heavy metals and volatile organics. Uh, and then you can drop down to what we call the maintenance dose, which is three to five drops three times a day. And then every six to 12 months, you want to repeat the detox dose just to clean yourself out again. Now, that's if you're a regular healthy individual. Now, we conducted a study in coal miners from West Virginia. And these guys are obviously not healthy. They work in a coal mine. They're, they have lots of toxins in them. We had them take 10 drops three times a day over three months. And even after three months, they were excreting about 15 times the uh, amount of toxins they would at baseline, uh, which meant that they were still excreting huge amounts of heavy metals and toxins uh, taking the natural side of defense. And we can only suppose that's because of continued exposure. So if you live in an inner city, if you uh, work in a factory, if you know you're highly toxic, you should probably take higher doses for longer periods of time. Now, there is no upper dose. But we don't recommend people taking more than 15 drops at a time simply because it's passively absorbed. And the more you take, the less actually gets absorbed. And so if you want to maximize your dollar with the product, you don't want to take more than 15 drops at a time. And so we recommend taking 15 drops three to four times a day as with the maximum effective dose. That's about a 60-drop daily dose. Uh, we do have, as I said before, 14 clinical studies. Uh, we are starting to publish those studies. So hopefully by the next webinar I'm on, I can share a couple of the published studies with you guys. That would be great. That would be great. Now, are these, uh, are these all the same concentration? Or are there some different levels of concentration of the, the wire, the NPDs? No, no, no. There's only one concentration. It's approximately uh, 9 to 10 milligrams of zeolite per drop. Uh, so when we talk about, when I talked about uh, 100 drops of the zeolite being about one mm -hmm. gram of product, uh, that, that's all the same. Uh, it's all the same concentration. Okay, great. And um, you mentioned something about your business partner. He, he, did you say the pulmonary specialist? Yeah, uh, Dr. Stuart Lonke is actually triple board certified. He's internist, thoracic surgery, and uh, pulmonologist. But his main, oh, practice wow. is, uh, his main practice is his pulmonology in Los Angeles. Incredibly busy. Imagine how busy a lung doctor in Los Angeles is. So uh, uh, yeah. he, uh, he co-authored Invisible Killers with me. He's my co-author. He lectures with me. We are making a uh, documentary now. And it's me and Dr. Stuart Lonke. And uh, Peter Coyote is narrating the documentary. And uh, mm -hmm. so by the fall, hopefully it'll be out by the fall because we want to do a college lecture tour for next year. And we'll be visiting mm -hmm. some of the larger schools around the country and lecturing about the concept of invisible killers, the toxins, and how they affect us. You, you think you're gonna, you're gonna be free, your time will be freed up to do that then? <laughs> I fit it into everything else I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> hey, the other, um, we are. the other thing we're doing now, and I, I don't know if I mentioned this on our last webinar, is we've actually created a new business um, where we're cleaning up lakes. We're, uh, we're taking the zeolite, and not, we're not micronizing. We're using the larger particles. But we found that uh, if we do uh, activate the zeolite and we suspend it in a slurry, we can put that on lakes that have a lot of toxins in them, phthalates, dioxins, volatile organics, heavy metals. We can put it along the top of the lake as it slowly uh, comes through the lake, it actually cleans out the lake on the way down. When it hits the sediment at the bottom of the lake, it does something called sediment capping. It actually prevents toxins from getting out of the ground and back into the lake. And so it wow. effectively detoxifies the lake. Fish and wildlife eat the zeolite, and it actually cleans out the fish and wildlife. 
So on the average, say, 100-acre lake, toxic lake, it would need three applications. It, uh, one application, another in three months, another in six to 12 months, and in essence cleans out the lake. You wind up with crystal clean fish. You wind up with a, uh, a clean environment. Um, and so we've uh, actually started a new business. We're doing some uh, lakes around the country to prove the concept, uh, but we expect this to be a, uh, a very large topic in the next two to five years. Oh, absolutely. Well, I, I bet you're using quite a lot of zeolites to do that. Yeah, the average 100-acre lake will use about 15 tons. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. So it, 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 it is, uh, but believe it or not, it's not even cost prohibitive because uh, a lake like that, the way they normally clean it up, the way they do it today, is they would kill all the fish, they drain the lake, they bring in uh, heavy machinery to scoop up the bottom sludge on the bottom of the lake, uh, barrel that up and ship it off to landfills, where it simply gets buried and hopefully you know just stays in one place for the rest of eternity. Uh, mm -hmm. Then they refill the lake, usually naturally through springs or through mountain runoff, and then they restock the lake after it's refilled. Um, for the fir first thing, it doesn't even solve the problem because as the lake uh, starts to refill, it's highly toxic. <coughs> so it's highly toxic because of the mountain runoff, because of what's in the spring water, and what's still you know, trapped in the bottom of the lake. Um, Additionally, now you've killed all the fish, you've killed the wildlife, you've changed the, uh, the, uh, the, the ecosphere, you've changed everything around the lake, uh, and the cost for something like that is somewhere around $17 million. Uh, using our zeolite, you, you actually protect the fish, you protect the wildlife, you don't change the environment at all, and you're talking about doing it for about a million to $3 million. So it's a, also a huge cost saving. So uh, right. it's something that, uh, you know, that we've already been talked about. We're calling our product Remedialite, and you're going to see it in the news in the very near future. Well, please let us know as soon as, as, soon as that comes out. Um, I, before we go into questions, just want to ask you, uh, of course, thank you again. This, is a, this has been really, really good, uh, especially to talk about the cancer and, and uh, the, the viruses. I mean, that, that's, that's one aspect we didn't know much about. Uh, well, the focus in the first lecture was about heavy metal, so this is an, an, a, a great twist. Um, is there any way we we are looking for uh, this is on a personal note, note now? We are looking for someone to speak to us on resp the respiratory system and respiratory pro problems. Do you think uh, your partner might be w willing to to devote? Oh, absolutely. Sure, sure. Yeah, Dr. Lanky would love to do a webinar like this. Uh, I'll, I'll put you in touch with him, and you guys can schedule it. The only issue with with him is he, he if you think I'm busy, he makes me look like I'm standing still. So, uh, <laughs> so he, uh, yeah, he is uh, one of the busiest people I've ever met in my life. So he, uh, he just he just needs to schedule it. So I will put you two in touch and let him know what we've been doing, and, and I'm sure he'd be happy to schedule something. Okay, good. And Jerry, Jerry typed in here saying, "We have this recorded. <laughs> we have your statement <laughs> recorded, Rick." <laughs> Well, if you go to our Invisible Killers website, you can actually see him. Uh, he presented last year at the Cancer Prevention Society meeting in Los, in Los Angeles. And mm -hmm. so he uh, did a, a presentation. Anyone can uh, just uh, watch that on our Invisible Killers website. There's an audio and there's a video. Uh, so oh, you can see how he presents and some of the things he talks about. But he is an amazing presenter. He's got, got an amazing uh, wealth of knowledge in this field. And he's been using the zeolite and other detox methods for several years. So, uh, right. yeah, he'd be a great guest. Great. Well, thank you for, for, for promising to connect us. All right. Well, Sherry, um, go ahead and ask questions. Um, sure. So if Rick doesn't mind. Okay. All right. And if anybody has a couple more questions, you can go ahead and type them in for us. Um, Rick, one person was wondering, when will the research be published in peer-reviewed journals? Yeah, it's been a long, hard process for us. Uh, we were told over a year ago that it was uh, coming out in a month or so. And then we found out that at some point I didn't properly fill out my disclosure application. Uh -oh. uh, which says, and so I had to do that. And then uh, uh, in another case, uh, we didn't, um, I, I forget, there were, there were three or four things we didn't, you have to understand that my, my history, I always published, I was part of an academic institution. So we simply mm -hmm. wrote it and the school uh, covered the publication. And so we never had to do all the little things about disclosures and proper credit given and, and release of IRB. Yeah, this last time for this study, we uh, conducted the study at Duke University, but it was our study. We simply used their facility and their IRB, Internal Review Board. And their Internal Review Board had to sign off on the study prior to publication. They never did. And so we, mm -hmm. had, 
we didn't know that. We were sitting there for a year waiting for this publication. They finally told us that they never received IRB sign-off. And so we simply had to go back to Duke and get one paper signed and resubmit it. So we've been told that the first study uh, is imminent, which uh, about 30 days ago, which usually means 30 to 60 days. So we should see the first study very quickly. Uh, once that first study is published, we really believe it's going to be like uh, knocking over dominoes. Because once that first study is published, when we, uh, when we present the second study, people are going to be able to cite the first study. And oh, see that that's out there, it's ready to go. And when you're in a peer review board, the first thing you do is look for citations. You look for similar research that's already been published, because you don't want to be first. Right. And when you see that similar research, you sign off on it pretty quickly. So like I said, we've already got 14 studies finished and written up. Uh, we're just starting. In fact, I just today, I got the final documentation on the autism study we conducted. And uh, it looks fabulous. It looks much, much better than I expected. Um, because there were some problems with the study and study design, but it still came out great, uh, highly statistically significant with great results. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, we're going to write that up over the next two weeks and submit that as well. So uh, that's, a, that's actually a 15th study. So we, we have a lot of things ready to publish. Uh, I think we're looking for the first one. And then once that's published, you're going to see everything you know, fall like dominoes. Wow, and then you'll get even busier. <laughs> Hopefully I get less busy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, we got that recorded too. So. <laughs> okay, let's see. Um, this person said, I have had a kidney transplant, and after detoxing with the NCD, my kidney function test showed an improvement. So there's no problem excreting it through my kidneys. I guess that's not really a question, but just a statement somebody wanted to share. Well, I talk about that as well because my, uh, my father-in-law is a great patient for me. My, my wife's father has polycystic kidney disease, PKD, which is a very common genetic disorder uh, where the kidneys uh, grow cysts and they grow larger throughout life. And by the fourth or fifth decade, your kidneys are failing. And so um, you usually wind up on dialysis or kidney transplant list. And that's what happened to him. And he went up with a kidney transplant. And about five years after his kidney transplant, uh, he was suffering from lymphedema, you know, painful swelling in the feet and the legs. And, uh, and his creatinine and bun numbers were going up, which indicated uh, kidney failure or rejection. And so the, the, uh, the uh, renal doctor uh, expected, thought there was a rejection episode. He wanted to get him back on dialysis and schedule him for another kidney transplant. I started him on a natural side of defense. And there's two things to think about. First, that he's a transplant recipient. So you don't want to take anything that improves immune system function because you can facilitate rejection. Mm. And, uh, and the second thing is, would it be hard on the kidneys? And what we found is after about two weeks in the natural side of defense, his bun and creatinine levels plummeted. They came down to normal ranges, and his lymphedema went away. And so uh, it, it obviously didn't facilitate rejection, so it's perfectly safe in transplant and, uh, recipients and in auto, people with autoimmune diseases. And it's perfectly healthy for the kidneys as well. The only thing I'll, I'll point out is that people on dialysis, active dialysis, probably don't want to take more than, say, five drops three times a day. So the zeolite is dialyzed out. It's easily, easily dialyzable. But most dialysis patients can't drink enough water to support active detoxification. They're, they're mm. inhibited in the amount of water they drink. So because of that, I don't recommend that dialysis patients take too much of the zeolite. Okay, but it would still be beneficial to them in small doses. Absolutely. So even a drop a day is beneficial, but I would recommend, say, five drops two to three times a day for a dialysis patient. Okay, well, that, that's perfectly answered one of the questions of somebody had had both kidneys removed and was on dialysis, so that's great you answered that for us. Uh, let's see, this next one's a little bit diagnosis-ish maybe, but I'll go ahead and read it. Um, it says, I have a friend with cancer in the brain, spine, liver, and kidneys. How many drops per day should he take of the NCD and for how long? He says none of his organs are shutting down yet. Well, like I said, we can't make any claims of the treatment or prevention of disease. Um, what we found is that uh, if you really want to maximize utilization of the zeolite, you take lower doses more often. Uh, mm -hmm. So where we talked about the 60 drop daily dose, 15 drops four times a day, if you could take three to five drops every hour, you're still mm -hmm. getting that same 60 drop daily dose, but you're maximizing absorption. So if that's a feasible uh, way for them to take it, if they can be compliant on that, three to five drops every hour, I think they'd maximize the benefit. Okay. What if somebody's just doing the 10 drops a day? Should would it be better to spread that out over the day, just for an hour? It actually, it actually would. But the, my problem is this: once you start making uh, dosing more complicated, 
people are less compliant. Mm-hmm. You know, so if you can tell them to take it two, three, four times a day, and they know breakfast, lunch, dinner, bedtime, they can remember that. But once you start saying take it every hour and they're setting a clock or they're trying to remember, you see, I, I'm pretty easy about it. I keep a, a bottle in my pocket, and whenever I reach in my pocket, I take a couple of drops. So mm-hmm. I'm, I'm constantly, and I, I probably take about, probably about 30 drops a day, but I do it every couple hours and squirting some stuff in my mouth. Right. I, 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 that's the way I do it. I try to be easy about it. Um, but most people can't be that, can't be compliant on those regimens. So certainly it's healthier for everybody to take lower drops, lower doses more often. Uh, but with cancer patients, with people with chronic illnesses, it, it really does make a huge difference. Okay. There's one last question. It says, I've been told that detox foot pads are of no benefit. What about detox foot baths? Yeah, you know, I, I, I feel really bad because there's some people that swear by this, but this <laughs> has been disproved uh, clinically, and, uh, and they're basically the same, same uh, issue. Um, about three years ago in Hong Kong, uh, 14 of these foot bath saunas were shut down by the government mm. uh, because, of, because of fraud. And they didn't blame the practitioners because the practitioners were simply doing what they were told, uh, but they did blame the manufacturers, and there were several people were jailed over this. And if you've ever seen these foot baths, basically they take a, uh, a sonic foot bath, a vibrating foot bath, they put warm water in it, and then they put these salts in, these special herbal salts that are supposed to detoxify you. You put your foot and feet in there for about a half hour. Over the half hour, the water turns dark, it bubbles, it turns black. Sometimes you even see things swimming around in there. Disgusting. And they say, oh, those are the toxins coming out of your feet. And those are, see those things? Those are uh, parasites that are coming out of your body. Well, you know what? I'm not so desensitized. I can feel a worm crawling out of my foot. You know? <laughs> <laughs> That's not going to happen. Plus, you've got to understand that you don't detoxify through your feet. Your feet, are, they just don't sweat that much. You don't waste too many things out of your feet. It's a bad place to detoxify. Now, certainly, because of lack of circulation, people with lymphedema, people with gout, do tend to acquire things in their feet. And you can get some things out of your feet with those patients, but not with everybody. Okay? And with those patients, they're better off putting their feet up and improving circulation and trying to remove the gout and remove the lymphedema. Um, what they found with those foot baths and also with the foot pads is what they do is they put uh, those salts contain metals. Those metals oxidize and turn dark, and that's where the color comes from. They even put in, uh, in, in my case, they were brine shrimp eggs. Remember sea monkeys when we were kids? Mm-hmm. You know, you got those sea monkeys in the mail, and you put them in the water, and they, they sprout. They're like little shrimp, you know? That's basically what they do, and they hatch pretty quickly in the warm, vibrating water, and you have these things swimming around. And so it's, it's all in the salt that they add that shows this, uh, this, this, uh, this action. And then, of course, people say, but I felt so good. I, it was so good for me. I'm like, well, yeah, you're having your feet massaged in a bath. That feels great, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And then you see yeah. the same thing with those foot pads. Those foot pads are impregnated with metals uh, that oxidize readily when they get wet. And so when you sweat in those foot pads, they turn dark. The fact is, if you just soaked them in salt water, they would turn dark as well. Uh, they, they, uh, you just put them in a solution of salt water, they'll turn black. Uh, and then the question is, well, I used those foot pads, and you know, I used them for a week, and every day they got less and less stark, so that meant I was detoxing. No, what's happening is you're putting these foot pads in your feet, and you're sweating really bad the first couple of days, but by the sixth or seventh day, you don't sweat as much. You've dried out your feet. And mm-hmm. so you're not, you're, not, uh, you're not activating the metals. It's not as dark. And then when you do it in six months or so, guess what? Your feet are sweaty again. Right. So, so that's really the function. That's the action of those products. And it really is kind of criminal because I know somewhere along the line some manufacturer knows what the action is, uh, and I feel bad for the people that are taken in by it and then use them, you know, religiously because they believe that they're so active. Right. And um, just so everybody knows, on the screen at the bottom is our website, buildingstrengthwebinars.com. And about halfway down the page, right after the description of tonight's webinar, there is actually a link that says for information on how to purchase uh, zeolites, click here. So uh, it takes everybody straight to a page. If you want to know where you can find out information about it, you can go to our web page and find that. So you've answered all the questions. There's one last comment. Somebody typed in and it says, Rick, you are fabulous, exclamation point, exclamation point. So that's, <laughs> that's probably crazy. a good to, to close on. David, did you uh, want to say anything else? Yeah, yeah. Well, well, like in, 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 at the beginning of the webinar, I said this is a win-win-win situation. We get to have a great webinar. Uh, the people have um, their products sold. 
Not everybody knows how great Rick is. <laughs> Let me just add a couple of things with my own plug. Please, everyone, go to InvisibleKillers.com. If you haven't signed up for our free newsletter and our, uh, our blog, please sign up for it. Just go to InvisibleKillers.com and sign up for it. Um, there's also one other thing I want to bring up that uh, I, I didn't bring up in today's uh, lecture, and that's the concept of Chinese drywall. I don't know. If, are you familiar with the, what's happening with Chinese drywall? No, I'm not. Sherry, are you familiar with this? No, I'm not, but let me also just interject one thing that I do need to say since I told everybody about our website. If somebody else recommended you to come watch this webinar um, that, that is with Wayora, please get back to the person who recommended um, that you attend this webinar tonight. Yeah, yeah we don't want to go around anyone you've already spoken no, to. No, we so, don't. But yeah. no, Rick, I haven't heard of that. Well, everyone who's listening to this, please do a web search for Chinese drywall. It is really horrendous. Basically, between 2005 and 2007, we had a building boom in this country, and we ran out of drywall. Well, drywall, which is the sheet rock that's used in, the, in, in, uh, in our wall boards, is only made of one ingredient. It's called gypsum, which is calcium sulfate. And we basically ran out of gypsum in the United States. So the Chinese opened three huge gypsum mines, and they, they shipped about 48 to 55 million tons of drywall in 2005 and 2006. Uh, the problem is that they have very low quality control in their gypsum mines. And so it wasn't just calcium sulfate. It also contains strontium sulfide and iron disulfide. And what happens is in these houses, uh, after a few years, in some cases just several months, as uh, the space between the walls get warm, it starts to leach off these sulfur gases. The sulfur gases build up in the house. They cause respiratory dysfunction, asthma. They cause hives. Uh, they cause eye damage. And then they also eat away at the electrical system. They eat away at the wirings in the wall. They creep up the cords. So anything that's plugged into the wall gets damaged as well. So computers get damaged, TVs, refrigerators, microwave ovens. Um, I actually own a house that has Chinese drywall, and so I'm dealing with the issues right now. Um, it's not the house I live in, but my sister-in-law lives there. So uh, my wife is accusing me of trying to kill her sister's family. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but the worst part is that in about 100,000 homes in the United States, um, any homes that were built during the boom, 2005 to 2007, and that includes Katrina victims in Alabama, Mississippi, Mississippi and Louisiana. So here they, they survived this hurricane. They got their new houses built, and now they're highly toxic. Mm -hmm. uh, so the only thing that can be done is the, uh, the house has to be uh, stripped. The drywall has to drywall all has to come down to the studs. The electrical system has to be replaced in the entire house and then new drywall has to be put up. So it's really a complete disaster. Uh, and we, uh, you're going to hear more and more about it in the federal news. But just understand this. If you have a home that was built in that time frame, uh, you might have respiratory issues. You might have problems that you can't identify. And it could be related to the Chinese drywall. So something really simple you can do is take the uh, cover off your outlet, the little plastic outlet cover, and look at the grounding wire to that outlet. It should be bright copper colored, like gold colored. If it's not, if it's black, if it looks like there's insulation on it, that's an indication of Chinese drywall. It's the sulfur gases building up in between the walls. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's a real easy test to see if you might have Chinese drywall. And just be aware that it's a, it can be a, considered a major health issue and something we all need to look for. Wow, oh, that's great information. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, that's good to know. It's really good to know. Wow. Uh, I'm just saying there's toxins we don't even know about. There's things that we that every day we learn something new that could be in our environment that could be damaging us. And knowledge is power. The more we know, the more we can do something about it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, well, folks, um, if remember, the MP3s will be available within 24 hours. So just to watch out for them. Um, we are going to start a membership program so people can get discounts off the of the webinars. Uh, we might start beginning to charge for some webinars, so just stay in touch. But we, we're going to make it as cheap and as possible so everybody can benefit from it. Uh, Sherry, anything else you want to mention? Um, I don't think so. Just thank you again, Rick, and thank you, everyone, for joining us. Yeah, thanks, Rick. Oh, wait, I'll, I'll do one more plug. I'm going to be on the road at the end of the month. So on the 28th, uh -huh. uh, I'm sorry, on the tw I think it's the 29th, whatever that Thursday is, I'm going to be in Tulsa. And on that Saturday, I'm going to be in Daytona, and, and uh, I'm sorry, Dayton, Ohio. So uh, anyone who's anywhere near Tulsa, Oklahoma, or Dayton, Ohio, uh, I'll be there on the uh, the Thursday, at the end of the month, and then May 2nd, that Saturday, I'll be in Dayton, Ohio. 
So uh, if you want to see me live, if you want to be able to answer, ask any questions, uh, just uh, you can check, go to wayor.com and check on city events for the location. But uh, those are the cities I'll be in in a few weeks. Great. Well, 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 Linda and I will definitely meet you when you, when you get here. She's looking forward to meeting you too. Oh, fantastic. The, the, the lady who spoke at the beginning. Okay, well, okay. you guys, Thank this has been a great much. webinar. Uh, thanks, Rick, and see you guys Thursday or next week. God bless. Bye. Bye.